Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, my sisters and brothers, welcome. I hope you are all safe and well. We will commence today's proceedings with the recitation of a Quranic ayat, followed by a translation and remarks. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل الله ينفقون أموالكم في سبيل الله كمثل حبة بتت سبع سنابل كمثل حبة بتت سبع سنابل في كل سنبلة مئة حبة في كل سنبلة مئة حبة والله يضاعف لمن يشاء والله يضاعف لمن يشاء والله واسع عليم صدق الله العلي العظيم The likeness of those who expend their wealth in the way of God is as the likeness of a grain of corn that sprouts seven years. In every ear, a hundred grains. So God multiplies unto whom he will. God is all-embracing, all-knowing. Thank you. My name is Alicia Sharif, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the annual Milad al-Nabi event, broadcast on Ismaili TV for the first time from the Ismaili Centre, London. Milad al-Nabi is the day Ismailis and other Muslims within the Ummah celebrate the birth of our beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him and his progeny. This event will be a conversation between Professor Muhammad Iqbal Asariya and Mr. Mahmoud Ahmed, focusing on the quest for a moral economy in the post-COVID era. Professor Asaria will share his reflections on this topic through a short presentation, after which our two discussants will explore the subject in greater depth. A little history before I introduce our speakers. The Ismaili Centre London is one of a number of Ismaili centres around the world. These contemporary buildings reflect the rich architectural heritage of Islam, as well as serve a functional purpose. They are places of congregational prayer for Ismaili Muslims and offer a space for dialogue and learning. This particular center in London was opened in 1985 by His Highness the Aga Khan, Imam of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims and the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the late Baroness Thatcher. His Highness the Aga Khan is the 49th hereditary Imam or spiritual leader of the Shia Imami Ismaili Muslims in direct lineal descent 
of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his progeny. His Highness is also the founding chairman of the Aga Khan Development Network, or AKDN, which is made up of private, international, and non-denominational agencies. These agencies work synergistically to improve the welfare and prospects of people in the developing world, particularly across Asia and Africa. Most recently, the AKDN has partnered with the Earthshot Award Project, pioneered by His Royal Highness Prince William, the Duke of Cambridge, and Sir David Attenborough. Now to our two speakers. Professor Mohammed Iqbal Asaria, CBE, is a visiting professor at the London Institute of Banking and Finance, as well as City University Business School. He also teaches at Bangor Business School and is special advisor on business and economic affairs to the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain. He is a seminal and influential voice in the Islamic insurance or takaful industry, where he convenes the International Takaful Summit. He was awarded his CBE in the 2005 Queen's Honours List for services to international development. In conversation with Professor Asaria will be Mr. Mahmoud Ahmed, who is currently chairman of the Aga Khan Foundation UK National Committee and a consultant at Adam and Ramis LLP, a legal practice in London. He was AKDN diplomatic representative to Uganda from 2005 to 2016, with additional responsibility for Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan, and acted as AKDN's liaison with the East African community from 2012 to 2016. He was a member of the Constitution Review Committee that worked under His Highness's guidance in drafting the global Ismaili constitution. Chairman Mahmood also held various UK National Council roles between 1984 and 2002, including as council president. He pursued these roles alongside practicing law in London. Before we begin tonight's discussion, I would like to welcome Dr. Fahad Mawani, chairman of the Ismaili Tariqa and Religious Education Board, to the podium to say a few words. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Assalamu Alaikum, and Yali Madad. On behalf of the President and members of the Ismaili Council for the United Kingdom, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the annual and now global Ismaili Center Milad Lecture. The occasion of Milad al Nabi, which marks the birthday of Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him and his progeny, is an event of great significance for Muslims around the world and on behalf of the Ismaili community, I thank you all for joining us. The annual Milad al Nabi lecture has been a feature of Ismaili centers worldwide for over 30 years. These lectures epitomize the center's role, not only as places of reflection and contemplation, but also as places of invitation for men and women to recognize the need to pursue the common good based on the universal ethic and vision that is grounded in Muslim intellectual and cultural heritage. For Muslims, the celebrations of the birthday of the Prophet represent an opportunity to engage with the intellectual traditions and cultural expressions of Islam. We are not alone in celebrating in this way. Indeed, there are many sister Muslim communities celebrating Milad al Nabi through lectures, devotional songs, poetry, discussions, and storytelling. The need to come together and recognizing the strength of diversity in addressing the issues that face humanity is more pressing day by day. Human societies globally are grappling with issues of climate change, tensions between social and political group, groups, more equitable management of resources, and increasing levels of poverty. Where the current pandemic 
has brought to the surface the fissures in our social, economic, and political fabric. It has also impressed upon us our mutual dependency and our need for each other. Today's celebration of Milad al-Nabi is a time especially for Muslims to dedicate themselves both in thinking and in action towards caring for the environment, promoting fairness, and helping to improve the quality of life of those less fortunate than ourselves. Given this challenging scenario, it is important now more than ever that we look back at our heritage and excavate voices that speak to our current predicament. No doubt they are there, and it is for us to search, to reflect, to find, to adapt, and to apply. The Milad Lectures aim to provide a platform for thinkers to speak to the present human predicament in light of the Prophet's ethical commitment and explore how the Muslim tradition can contribute to, re to the resolution of global issues. I'm eager to hear what our guest speaker, Professor Muhammad Iqbal Asariya, will say about seeking a moral compass that the Muslims share with other faith communities for our roadmap to address the shortcomings in the global economy. I thank Chairman Mahmoud Ahmed for graciously accepting to moderate this session and to elaborate on the key issues highlighted in this talk. Finally, I would like to take the opportunity to extend our collective gratitude to our volunteers, too many to mention individually, for supporting today's lecture. And now, I would like to call upon Alicia to introduce our guest speaker and our moderator. Thank you, Chairman Mawani, for those remarks. It is now my profound privilege and honor to invite Professor Asaria to come to the podium and deliver the 2020 annual Milad al nabi lecture as a global Ismaili center lecture. Audhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal makhluqeen. Sayyidina wa Nabiina Abul Qasim Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It is my great pleasure to be invited by the Ismaili Center for the prestigious Miladun Nabi lecture. I thank Chairman Mahmood and our friends here who have made this possible. As you know, this is a great responsibility and I hope, inshallah, to be able to discharge it as much to the best of my abilities. We come to this Milad lecture at a very, very strange time. We are all perplexed by things which we never thought were possible even a year ago, let alone more than a year ago. We are, as we know, we are in the middle of this pandemic and this follows on from the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9. We are beginning now to see that perhaps everything we thought was solved is not solved. And we have to start somewhere again, try to get our moral compass back. Who better than to give us a moral compass in these difficult times than our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophet, as we know, Muslims, was spoken of as the Uswatul Hasana in the Quran. That means the best of examples, the top example which Allah could give of mankind is the Prophet. The Prophet's own behavior 
was so meticulous that even his enemies was forced to call him Al-Amin and Al-Sadiq, a trustworthy and the man with integrity. As we know, even when the Quraysh wanted to repudiate the message of the Quran, they could not say that the Prophet was lying because his character did not allow that to be said of him. The only thing they could say is that he has gone mad, which is obviously something which we cannot uh, prevent. But we see that this character created such a moral compass that it provided the Muslims across the ages up to today with a complete beacon of how to behave with equity and justice. So today, my friends, we are faced with this very strange situation where we thought in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000, three decades, three, four decades, that we had solved all human problems. People like Francis Fukuyama started to write books called The End of History. He was saying neoliberalism, market economics, and democratic capitalism was everything mankind needed to know about behavior. There was nothing more to be found out. The only thing left was to spread this mantra across the globe by persuasion or by force, if that became necessary. Ten years on from his book, we saw the outbreak of the global financial crisis. When the global financial system came to a near breakdown and was going to collapse and was saved by taxpayers. What we saw in this crisis was that we had developed a system in which we had created a small clique which believed in monopolization of profits, but when they fell into trouble, it also believed in socialization of losses. This prescription clearly was untenable globally. And since then, it has started to create a underclass of people who do not feel belonging. And we have seen the increase in populism and all kinds of things. Unfortunately, before we could take proper lessons from this, we were now confounded with this COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic shows that it is not possible to live in small silos. The rich cannot isolate themselves from the poor and the desperate. Everybody is one. Humanity is one. Like when the prophet said, my ummah is like one. If one part is like a body, one part of the body is in pain, the whole body is uncomfortable. And that is how I would like to look at the ummah. However, we came to this with the pandemic, and even before that, to some extent, a re-examination has begun globally. In fact, I believe that there is a new zeitgeist developing globally to re-examine the market-dominated economy. Markets without morality, we find, deliver outcomes which are humanly unacceptable. And so we started to think, how do we think about it now? Muslims, we go back to the situation and we say that we need to look at the purpose of creation. Allah says, I created mankind as a khalifa when he created Adam which means as a steward of the resources I have made available to them, not as an abuser of the resources. And then we find the emphasis on justice and equity as absolute. So this is the moral compass 
we need to get back to in order to see what we can do. In fact, other faith communities are also coming to this conclusion. And there is a beautiful uh, encyclical for Pope Francis called Laudato Si, The Common Good, in which he says, mankind now is forced to look at the common good. We cannot be selfish and individualistic. We cannot be comfortable with greed, because in this world, there is enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed. And we need to now regain our spirituality, stop creating poor people, instead of merely serving poor people. And so we go on. Other faith traditions also, Abrahamic traditions, non-Abrahamic traditions, all of them are beginning to look inside to see what we can do in this situation. If we think that this is uh, the end of it, I'm afraid we have some very grim news coming. We have the climate and environmental challenge piling up. If you want to think about it, think about it as the pandemic is not even one iota of the problems which climate change and environmental crisis will create. In fact, it will be many times more. And the climate crisis, because it develops gradually, it doesn't hit you like the pandemic, so it doesn't force you to take action now. But the pandemic is a warning, I believe, from God to mankind that start thinking of other things which can happen and take action in time. And that is what we need to do. And this occasion of the Miladun Nabi offers us an opportunity to look at it. I like to end these initial remarks by just quoting from a couple of passages from the presidential address of His Highness the Al Khan at the International Sirat Conference on the 12th of March, 1976 in Karachi. As you can see, it's nearly 50 years ago, and this is an exceptionally prescient address. And His Highness says, I have observed in the Western world a deeply changing pattern of human relations. The anchors of moral behavior appear to have dragged to such depths that they no longer hold firm the ship of life. What was once wrong is now simply unconventional and for the sake of individual freedom must be tolerated. What is tolerated soon becomes accepted. Certainly what was once right is now viewed as outdated, old fashioned and is often the target of ridicule. In the face of this changing world, which was once a universe to us and is now no more than an overcrowded island, confronted with a fundamental challenge to our understanding of time, surrounded by a foreign fleet of cultural and ideological ships which have broken loose, I ask, do we have a clear, firm, and precise understanding of what Muslim society is to be in the times to come? And as if I believe, as I believe, the answer is uncertain. Where else can we search than in the Holy Quran and in the example of Allah's last and final prophet? There is no justification for delaying the search for the answer to this question by the Muslims of the world, because we have the knowledge that Islam is Allah's final message Quran, his final book, and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his last prophet. We are blessed that the answers drawn from these sources guarantee that neither now nor at any time in the future will we be going astray. The Holy Prophet's life gives us every fundamental guideline that we require to resolve the problem as successfully as our human minds and intellectuals can visualize. His example of integrity, loyalty, honesty, generosity, both of means and of time, his solicitude for the poor, the weak and the sick, his steadfastness in friendship, his humility in success, 
his magnanimity in victory, his simplicity, his wisdom in conceiving new solutions for problems which could not be solved by traditional methods without affecting the fundamental concepts of Islam. Surely, all these are foundations which correctly understood and sincerely interpreted must enable us to conceive what should be a truly modern and dynamic Islamic society in the years ahead. This word is ring so true in this time. And I'm glad that we have found this occasion to re reflect on the kind of moral compass which the Prophet provided to see how do we navigate these difficult times ahead. I now uh, give, it, give the chair to Chairman Mahmoud to see if we can raise some questions on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. A, a very... Um a very moving, a moving presentation, and uh, lots of food for thought. If we can just unpack some of this. I, you you you're, uh, spoke about the moral economy and also used an expression, moral compass. Now, if we may just unpack this a little bit. I, can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by the moral economy? And, and also, in terms of the moral compass. I mean, this is quite a fancy expression. You know, people can get, wonder what this means. Because <clears throat> I, I, I would just put it to you that are we talking about more, when we talk about the moral compass, are we simply talking about the ethic of honesty? It's a much easier concept to understand. And I just wonder whether, in your view, this moral compass encompasses, I'm sorry to, to use that word again, but takes on board much more than honesty. If so, how? Maybe you could just elaborate on those points a little bit. Okay, thank you very much for that. The moral economy really is a recent um, ex acceptable expression. It was always there, but before this uh, financial crisis especially, those who were talking about morality and economics were being laughed at. Say so you are still old-fashioned, as His Highness has pointed out as well. Just forget about those things. After the crisis, financial crisis especially, people started to think that there's something wrong with the market economy. The market economy, as you know, had developed to such an extent that the belief was spreading that the market is God. Whatever happens in the market is acceptable. Everything else has to adjust to that. And in fact, we started to selectively neglect our own human past wisdom. So take the example of Adam Smith, who is often quoted as the founder of the market economy, right? The, the hidden hand of the market. This was his expression in the wealth of nations. Very few people know or are told, actually, because not everybody has got time to look into these things, that his first book was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And not he, many people know that. Not many people know that, indeed. And in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, Adam Smith describes man as a moral man. So the wealth of nations assumes that we are addressing to moral man not to somebody who wants to ditch morality altogether, who has his ethics, who has his morality, who has his belief there, and then he's behaving. And then the market can help you. So as the market developed, obviously we neglected the moral sentiments. We started to focus on the market. Then we started to find out that the market sometimes fails. Uh, let me give you a, a very, very uh, interesting example since we are in London. At some point in time, Parliament had to be suspended in the summer. And not for anything else. This was because the Thames was stinking so much that the MPs couldn't sit and tolerate the stink. And then they found that this stink was coming from all kinds of chemical and other discharges up the river, and of course, by, and then in the summer heat, this was all, you know, evaporating and creating this thing. This is where they started to think that we should stop these guys just dumping everything in the river. I mean, this is going to 
make problems. Nowadays, we know much more about these issues. We started to control what can you discharge into these things. But now, that time, it was felt as an interference in the market. So there were lots of market failures of this kind building up over the period of time. And these market proponents was just saying, ignore it. These are all out. Lately, after the 80s, 90s, there was this idea of market externalities, which developed, where economists started to say that markets cannot solve this problem. To give you a simple example, even today, we are struggling with equity in gender pay. Women are paid about 30 40% less than men in equivalent jobs. So, so let me ask you something. I just want to, if I just turn to how we actually got here. Yeah. Because, <clears throat> I mean, in, if you, you uh, read part of His Highness's address at the Sirat conference in the 70s, and so I just ask you, was it around the 70s, or was it later, around 2007, 2008, at the time of the global financial crisis? When did the realization begin to sink in at a wider level that this ethos of individualism was, was you know, causing a problem? Uh, I mean, you, you've drawn attention now to COVID. Um, we, we, we see the climate emergency again uh, probably a much bigger issue than COVID, but, you know, in driving us in that direction. So I'm trying to get a grip on how we got here, almost without realizing, if you see what I mean. I, you're right that it was imperceptible in that sense, but it started with the times of President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher here, when they went to a market solution. The post-World War II consensus of having a welfare state underpinning a sort of providing a social safety net for the most underprivileged sections of society was beginning to be questioned. Taxation to solve these problems of poverty were also being questioned. So the mantra was that lower tax, cut these social safety nets as much as you can and encourage market to work. It was felt that if markets enrich a certain proportion of people, this increase in productivity will filter down, or we call it in economics, the trickle-down effect. It will trickle down to everybody. In fact, we found that it was not trickling down. In the 80s, 90s, the realization started to dawn that these things are not trickling down. Instead, the rich are hoovering up, even whatever is left. And it was just before the financial crisis that things came to a head. People started to realize that this was now becoming unsustainable. We are putting people into so much debt to keep up their living standards that it is like a time bomb. Let's give you a small example. Uh, you, all of us, must have heard about the subprime mortgage crisis mm -hmm. in the States, which, mm -hmm. which triggered off. In the subprime mortgage market, and there is a film which is, I think, available on the uh, internet. It's called The Big Short, which is describing the subprime market. And in it, there is a scene, if I remember correctly, a man from a bank, he goes to somebody's house, knocks the door and said, I've come to repossess your house. Uh, do you know uh, Mr. So-and-so? so that I can serve the notice to him or her. And I said, this is my mother-in-law's dog. Do you mean that we, you lent the money to my mother-in-law's dog? So it had gone to that level. It wasn't important who was being lent. As long as you can circulate and financialize yes. and then securitize and send it on, you were fine. So you could see this is symbolic of what was happening. And people like Peter Mandelson, who were in the labor government, said, we are, in t we are very, very intensively relaxed with greed. Yes, I mean, that we, this, but it, I just look at globalization. I mean, in, in, to just sort of look at the way globalization has changed 
things for us in a very big way. Essentially, you can see a pattern where the, 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 the structures of the global economy have grown deep roots. Right? But at the same time, people's understanding of a larger common humanity are very tentative, very fragile. And the, the impulse to use one's effort to exploit is, uh, is very strong. And we don't yet, I, I, we are getting there, but I don't think we yet have a sense of a, of a shared destiny. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, I think this is plain for us, but I wanted to just take you back to the time of the Holy Prophet, may peace be upon him and his progeny. Now, he performed a remarkable feat. Uh, you know, in a very short space of time, you know, you had a very harsh society. Let's put it that way. It was practicing infanticide and all sorts of, uh, there was a very harsh and rigid society there. And in, this, in the space of a few years, he changed things. I'm wondering how he did that, because this is something which we face today. If we want to change things, how do we do it? Are there any lessons to be drawn from the way he did it? So this is what we mean by a moral compass. Somebody providing, from example, such a personality that people intuitively say, this is what we want. To develop your theme further, as you know, when the Prophet's followers, after being persecuted, migrated from Makkah to Medina, they were welcomed by the uh, Ansars, the people of residence of Medina. The Prophet sort of upped the stakes and went further. He put the hand of one migrant and one resident into each other's hands and said, from today you are brothers, share everything you have with each other. Sorry to interrupt you, but who was bringing the larger portion of that share? Because the immigrants were not bringing anything. They had no, fled. that's what I mean. Yes, so exactly. it was very generous it of the was, answer. It, this is what I'm saying. Now, for those people to agree, must, they must have seen something in the prophet that, yeah, this is. So sometimes you know that the greater good comes from sharing, not from monopolizing. And then you know what happened in the next 50 years after that. Muslims literally became the most powerful traders in the world. Little did they know at that time that this sharing is going to create the nucleus for that movement. This is what we mean by a moral compass. We need that beacon of light to say that believe in sharing, as we read from the Quran in the beginning as well, those who give from what Allah has given them, it's like it multiplies many folds. We don't believe that when we are individualistic. When we become social animals, we believe that. But things like the COVID and the environmental crisis is now forcing us to say that you don't want to share, all of you will perish. So it's also a mixture of belief and moral compass if we want to get out of this or if you want to do something good out of it. In fact, I, I would say that it's, uh, it's um, interesting to see that young people in today's society seem to be, generally speaking, better informed and more, I would say, sincere about doing something about all of this. Now, is it, is it, is it self-interest? I mean, they are going to be around for longer. They're going to see the consequences of this quicker. What, what is it that drives human beings towards doing something about the problem that you have articulated so well that we now face, how can we draw some sort of confidence, some optimism that we will actually get there in the sense that what's the motivating factor? So, uh, Jim, the young people have two different tendencies, right? They start with a lot of idealism, which is very good. As they grow, they become like you and me, more realistic, averse to risk, averse to experimenting new things and so on. It's that period, if we capture them and they're thinking that time, we can move mountains. Also because they are not tainted by adverse experience and so on. 
Let me give you an example. When the prophet came, I mean, if I were to tell you that these 100, 200 Bedouins are going to rule the world, you would have told me, are you crazy? But at that time, the Roman and Persian Empire were shaky. They were adverse to risk. They were thinking, but here was a pure soul saying, let's go. The prophet writing to the main ones, I am the prophet of God. I've come to invite everybody to Islam. Give up your this kind of worship and join me. Today I am going to write that to Reagan. What is he going to tell me? Who is this joker? But he had that character and he inspired his people. So the young people today provide that nucleus to us who have not been tainted by experience, too much prevarication, and also vested interests. As they grow, obviously, they will have developed interests in that. So we need to make sure that we direct them into positions where they begin to do good and see the benefit of doing good. I mean, in an interesting sort of way, youth collectively have the potential to do for society today what the Holy Prophet did for the society of those days. This is a real possibility. I wanted to just ask you that, you know, this whole, I want to turn to the question of where do we go? How do we, what do we do about this? And in, to introduce that, I, I don't know if you've seen a, a film called Sorry We Missed You. Uh, it's a Ken Loach movie uh, about a nuclear family where there's debt involved and uh, the father of the family goes into a franchise for delivery of parcels. It's basically part of the gig economy. And the film then shows you how this family essentially suffers the most incredible hardship. And it's all very believable. It's a window into what life is like today. And it leads you to think, well, where do we go from here? Are, are things like, I don't know what sort of safety nets are there, but certainly that's a part of the solution. Where do we go? What sort of solutions can you propose as, as, a, as a man of finance, and particularly as a man of Islamic finance? So we are obviously looking at uh, what we can do within the moral compass and within the value system which we have. And discussion is now beginning, and of course it is now being speeded up, on things like providing a universal basic income to people. Obviously, what we can do in India or Pakistan, we can't do here, when here we can do much more because we are a much more wealthier society. Those are not as wealthy. But relative to every society, if we think of providing a universal basic income to all our citizens, then we can feel comfortable that we have looked after our people. Then obviously people develop their own abilities and build more. We are not against creation of wealth. We are against creation of illicit wealth and also hoarding of wealth. We are not against creation of wealth. Wealth creation is an important element of human life. Some people are saying universal basic income is too ambitious, so let us go for universal basic services. But everybody agrees that things like basic health and basic shelter and basic food provision is important. Not there every. shouldn't be people on the streets trying to find... There should never be people on the streets. Let me give you an example. My daughter was doing her uh, internship in Sudan in a an hospital. And she had taken some money with her. And so when she came back, I said, oh, what happened to your money? She said, I haven't got a single penny left. I said, what happened? She said, I go to the hospital and we see somebody it's an old man, come with the family. And then we prescribe them some medicine, and the family is crying. They're saying, we don't have the money to buy this medicine. So we give them $10, $20, whatever it is. But you can see the desperation which this creates from these poor people. And then they will do anything. And you, uh, we, have, uh, we know, for example, in our societies, People sometimes take bribes from desperation. People do all kinds of things. People go to loan sharks and all kinds of things which create even more problems. 
or people become indentured laborers to so to pay up their debt or whatever so we need to really need to work to remove those situations where desperation drives human behavior what about what about the dignity involved here i mean i know that from my position in aga khan foundation we're very clear about the work we do uh, is is designed to enable people to use their effort, their own effort, uh, to, to earn a living. So it just seems to me that, of course, universal basic income might be one of the solutions. But in actual fact, it cannot be really the solution. There has to be something more profound than that. In, uh, in, in terms of being able to find ways and means for people at large to use their effort, to use their time, to support themselves, otherwise it becomes very demeaning. So the question is, how do you enable? Mm. This is a very basic safety net I'm talking about. But look at, for example... It's for the emergency situation. Yeah, you're talking uh, about in, that. In, it's something to fall back on when nothing else works. But, but it will never be enough on its own, is the point. I, I don't think, otherwise people will not do anything, right? Yeah, true. So what we say, let me give you an example. If you have, for example, a person who wants to support his family properly is now able to uh, borrow uh, enough money so, so to buy, say, three cows or whatever. So then they sell the milk and do whatever and, and support the family. Through no fault of their own, if two of the cows die, they will not be able to pay back the loan and they will not be able to support. So we are working on solutions like micro-insurance which will take care of that situation. And for Muslims, we are working on a situation where the micro-insurance premiums will be financed from zakat. Zakat, as you know, is coming from well of people. So this is a way of enabling and putting a floor under people's uh, desperation so that when they fall into hard times through no fault of their own, they don't disappear. We have a means to take them back. The person has shown willingness, he's working hard, but now something like that has happened. A flood has come or whatever. So yeah, we have to think of creative solutions. I mean, you are in the uh, development side. You know that creative solutions are not easy to come by, but they are possible. And the question is enablement rather than just, you know, uh, firefighting. We don't want to just firefight and give food. As the prophet himself says, don't give people fish, teach them how to fish. So, obviously, all these uh, words of wisdom are there in old cultures and old faiths. Now, being realistic, you know, we have a global economy. Uh, the nation state is arguably disappearing gradually. You, we, it's, a, it's a phenomenon which we see in front of our very eyes, right, where global corporations wield more power, have more disposable resource than countries. And there is a struggle going on right now. And so the question I have for you is that where does this go? Because except for the very largest countries, you know, the smaller ones are having to struggle with all sorts of things. The tax revenue, for example, if you look at developing countries and their ability to collect tax, if you look at developed countries and the sheer wastage of resources, uh, it, it, it doesn't look very promising, does it, in that sense? And I don't want to, I don't want to take you down a sort of a, 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 a gloomy um, outlook, but I, I, I just ask myself that like the climate emergency, you know, do we have any uh, light at the end of the tunnel when we talk about the moral economy? So let's look at, I mean, obviously, not all the world's problems can be solved today, but just look at an example. Professor Muhammad Yunus, mm. the founder of Grameen Bank, yeah? he started this movement in Bangladesh to start with of empowering people through social loans and so on and then building on. And Grameen and a number of other microfinance institutions Obviously, he got the Nobel Prize for that, justly so, which was very important. And Professor Muhammad Yunus 
I met him in the 80s and said to him, Professor, I like what you are doing, but you are charging these poor people too much. And at that time, it was about 30%. So he said, young man, I was young then, so he said, sit down. He said, do you know what is the cost of delivery of these services to these people? He counted, he said, it's 28%. Roughly, so I'm making 2%, okay? Which then goes back into the pool, obviously. I'm making. If you can find ways to reduce the cost of delivery, we can improve this even more. Since then, technology has developed. So mobile money, mobile banking, all have become possible. And if you now go to Bangladesh, and you want to buy a SIM, like, you know, when people come here, they buy Libara or this or that, the best SIM to buy is Grameen SIM because they have now spread it across their network. Three million women, more than three million women in Bangladesh were empowered by Grameen. And with the other microfinance institutions in Bangladesh, the GDP growth rate of Bangladesh is about 2% higher than equivalent countries like India and Pakistan, just from this. One man with a crusading zeal, really, for this poor, can do this job. And then he has written a book. This is amazing to you, Chairman Mahmood. He says, the poor never default. His default rate is zero. Because his model is based on social behavior. He puts people into groups. They own each other. They support each other through thick and thin. They never default on the law. So it, there are, there are there things are which we can do. So we're, 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 we're in a situation where clearly the power of the youth, the power of technology, a better understanding of uh, global issues. I mean, for example, we have uh, a society here where we buy things in the full knowledge that uh, they're made by the effort of workers who are abused in faraway places. And frankly, that information taints us with the unfairness. And people are becoming much more um, aware, much more careful about what sort of economic impulses they pursue. So it, it, I, I don't know whether you would agree with that, but I, I, I'd say that there is actually uh, light at the end of the tunnel. This, these things will change, and they can change dramatically quickly, actually, probably much more quickly than the climate emergency can be rectified. For sure. And young people will be instrumental in this. Mm -hmm. So you, you remember that uh, many, many years ago, the fair trade movement was launched, trying to see that a fair price was paid to the grower of the crop, say it was coffee or whatever, cocoa or something. Uh, and there was a fair you know, balance between the two. And the fair trade movement went, but now it's been supplanted by all kinds of other movements. I mean, if you tell somebody that this is made, these shoes are made from animal skin, your market will be dead. Or it is made from child labor, like Nike had this problem, your market Nike will be dead. This boohoo has this problem in Leicester now, that the workers are not paid minimum wage or whatever. So you're right, that there is now this opportunity and awareness especially amongst the young, that we will not going to spend our buying power on things which we do not believe mm -hmm. in. Uh, we are able to make that sacrifice. It should be instrumental. So I, I, it's not doom and gloom. It's now channeling those energies in the right direction, especially with climate change and things. So many other things need to be taken into account. Well, thank you very much. I, I would love to continue discussing this with you. I, I, I think we've come roughly to the end of our, of our time together. I wanted to turn to our, our global audience, first of all, and on behalf of all our viewers, Professor Iqbal, I'd like to thank you for your wisdom. I can make a small remark, yeah? Please, please. On the, on the changing zeitgeist, if I say it. Zeitgeist meaning spirit zeitgeist of the time. Zeitgeist means the spirit of the time, right. yeah? So at one time it was market, 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 and profit, profit, profit. Now is morality, morality, morality. And this is symbolized by something which is very, very interesting. The Financial Times, which is the leading 
newspaper of the finance and market. I had now started a section called the moral money. Every week they have 10 to 12 articles on moral money. Financial Times to do that. Clearly, they have captured some opportunity, some window in the zeitgeist that we cannot, we will be left behind. Nobody will read us if we do not tackle these subjects. And it is making headway there. Yes. Now, can you, I would like you, can you draw attention to anything of that kind in the Muslim world? We, we, tend, to, we tend to be automatically, at least I, I admit to this, uh, of, of taking my um, examples from the developed world, although I've spent a lot of time in Africa and I can see how these countries really struggle, but they also do come up with some phenomenal ideas. I wonder whether from your knowledge in Takaful and other things that you've been working on, is there anything you can point to in the Islamic world that we should watch, that this is something which is moving in that direction that may actually uh, capture the imagination of the world and move us in that direction of a moral compass. Sure. So, as I said, Gramin is one example, which is entirely homegrown in Bangladesh and so on. Microfinance. Microfinance is yes. spread globally and so on. And now they're trying to build micro takaful on it so that we can put a floor under any failures, not from the, not for any fault of the borrower, but from circumstances which can change. But the thing to start with is that there are people like Professor Said Hossein Nasser. Some of you may have heard about him. Yes. In 1968, it's really before all of us started even thinking, there is written a book called Man and Nature, The Encounter of Man and Nature. And in there he says that if we neglect our spiritual heritage and our stewardship of nature, we will destroy it. And he has been writing and writing, even today he's writing on the same thing. That finally we are coming to grips with the idea that we need to respect nature. It's not one way. We can't just use and abuse resources. We have so he's a Muslim writer. Of course he's a Muslim. Now, I don't, I, in a sense, this is a, uh, an issue which cuts across all the faith communities. Uh, the Abrahamic faith, the other faiths, all of us, and the faith communities essentially are playing front and center role in all of this. Uh, so two questions around that. Can, is there anything that you can point to which would be worth looking at that is coming out of other leaders of faith communities? Uh, and then the other question which is linked to that is that in today's world, there are many people who are atheists. They don't have a faith as such or have no faith. And what is their motivating factor in this uh, idea of developing this moral compass? Is it purely self-interest or is it more to than that? So that's a, a double barrel question okay. for sure, you. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, as, far, as far as faith community is concerned, obviously, I've hinted at uh, the work of Pope Francis. Pope Francis, a recent you know, encyclical or something? Yeah, the encyclical uh, Laudato Si. And now there is another one which he has issued last week. Okay, the one I know is in 2015. That's not the one you mean. No, that's There's one the Laudato Si. Right. But last week he has issued one on hospitality uh, and looking after strangers or thinking about strangers. So it's just reinforcing the common good. But he is obviously leading. But he's remember he's coming from South America from the difficult and deprived areas of South America. Mm -hmm. He spent his life there. So he knows what is the situation on the ground. He knows that if we do not give this kind of uh, message to the poor, they will lose faith in God. Has God abandoned us? He says we need a standard thing. So no, we have to do this so that we can humanity in one go. You talk about people who don't believe in religion. Yes. Uh, or who are agnostic, if not atheist. Yeah. It's fine. Our job now, through things like climate change and things, explanation, is that people of faith obviously will have more identification with that. 
people who have no faith can also be convinced that the common good is in cooperation, is not in individualism. That's the message we have to give to humanity at large. That's not possible. I mean, I'm surprised to see that, I'm saddened a little bit to see that at the United Nations General Assembly recently, the Chinese Prime Minister came and said, we feel responsibility for the globe and we will aim towards zero carbon emissions by a very short period of time. He just upstaged the whole moral discussion. We don't have to agree, but we can see where the balance is shifting. But we have, uh, uh, we have the faith communities, obviously, and we've been talking about the economy and the moral compass and all of that, but I just, let me take you in our conversation to this area of ethics in public life. You know, we have a situation nowadays where this business of the ethical compass, uh, it's something which leads into almost every area. So if you look at public life, or you look at um, our um, institutions, uh, I mean, you have the situation with the Federal Aviation Agency, which seems to have been captured by a company it is supposed to be regulating, yeah. right? And you have these uh, actually leading to death of people because of, uh, of fallen standards. Uh, you have a situation where people openly denigrate experts. Uh, you know, experts, of course, uh, become experts because of a very long and arduous process of learning, and this is an embedded wisdom which equips them to deal with emergencies very quickly, instinctively, intuitively, right? What they call fast thinking. But we're, we're getting to a point where experts are denigrated. We're getting to a point where leaders in, our, in public life flout the rules. Uh, we have a, a position where the regulators don't do their job properly. Uh, is this something to really worry about? Do you think that fixing the moral economy will affect these aspects as well? Indeed. Uh, I think there was a time when regulation was considered to be red tape and nonsense. And what you hinted at about Boeing, for example, they captured the regulator. I didn't mention the name. <laughs> I wanted you to. No, it is true. Right. They captured yeah. the regulator. Yes. And the regulators uh, just ticked the boxes. Which Amazing. They said. Same thing happened to Volkswagen. Yes, of course. In their emission standards, yeah. These are very well-known global companies. For them to, you know, play fast and loose with regulations in such a way to harm humanity is shameful. And that shame is coming on. The, now a lot of the big businesses have come together and come back with a pledge to balance profit with purpose. If purpose is not proper, profits cannot be justified. And that will take to all kinds of things, executive pay, gender gaps, all kinds of other things, which will make it important for people to really think through ethics. And uh, some people, like the chairman of Unilever for a few years until he left last year, drove Unilever into a direction which is unimaginable in terms of its social responsibility, right? Cadbury's were nearly 100% free trade before they were taken over by an American company and then that business mm -hmm. also. So there are attempts where people are very serious about stewardship. And other, now other events happening, they will reinforce. Climate change will make it even more. It's possible, but we need to engage in the debate. We need to say we need to have this moral compass to begin. Individual behavior should be corrected so that we become examples rather than spongers on the poor. Do you have any closing remarks to make before I bring these proceedings to a, uh, a close today? I have always felt that the prophet provides an example which is amazing. We are not talking about the lifestyle in that period of time. We're talking about the overall vision, 
which he opens up. And I see that within 100 years, we are from Spain to China, all the trading and everything in this, because of the honesty inspired it trades. When you trust in honesty, you can create. So really from, it is an idea which grows. We should not be afraid that it is a minority idea at the moment. The idea grows and grows and grows and then takes over. We are at this one quite important window of opportunity in our time that the pandemic and the coming environmental crisis has opened this window for more people to think like us. We should either lead with them or join with them or whatever way we can influence the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. I want to, first of all, on behalf of our global audience, thank you very much for, for an inspiring talk and a very uh, stimulating discussion. It's a lot of food for thought here. And um, turning to our global audience, I would just like to say that on the occasion of uh, the Milad and Nabi, I wish everybody goodwill and uh, joy in the coming year. May we find the tools to be able to resolve the issues which uh, are facing us. And uh, let me say that this is a Milad and Nabi uh, occasion taking place at the Ismaili Center London, but we're expecting that there will be Milad celebrations on other occasions or indeed other events taking place at the Ismaili Centers around the world, so it becomes a, a brand in its own right. Uh, and uh, with those words, I'd like to bring things to a close also by thanking our volunteers who, have, as, as usual, carried out a phenomenal task in making this happen during COVID period. Well, thank you very much, Iqbal. And in these COVID times, I thought the best thing would be to bring these proceedings to a close by a traditional COVID-style elbow farewell in Kudahafi. So if you wouldn't mind donning your mask because we're going to be uh, we won't be quite the two meters allowed, separated from each other. And so, if I may just say to you again, really, very sincerely, thank you very, very much. It's been very stimulating, very enjoyable. And thank you very much. And Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you, everybody.